Can I get your name and job title, please? Matt Rollo, ESPN Crick Info, Assistant Editor. Uh, sir, who are the Glazer family? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, the Glazer family st- all sort of started in terms of their involvement with sport with uh, Malcolm Glazer, who quite late on in his life, having had a uh, business empire in the US, decided in the m- sort of mid early to mid noughties that he was going to take over uh, Manchester United. Um, he'd already at that point uh, bought and run for a few years uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in NFL. Um, but buying Man United was a pretty seismic thing. Um, they're obviously one of the, the biggest sporting clubs in the world, um, have a global fan base, have been one of the most successful teams in uh, English football, probably the most successful team in English football um, across the last however long you want to look back. They are the biggest club there are. Um, so he decided he wanted to buy them and it was a pretty controversial takeover at the time. So um, United were uh, publicly listed on the London Stock Exchange, which meant that a, any old schmuck basically could decide that they wanted to invest a few quid in Man United and would get a nice share certificate. Uh, and everyone was happy. They didn't have any debt. Uh, they were doing pretty well on the pitch at the time. They famously won the treble in 1999 and, and it sort of continued that success under Sir Alex Ferguson, who was this legendary manager. Uh, and then in 2005, uh, Malcolm Glazer comes along and decides that he wants to buy the club. Uh, that is immediately very controversial because of the manner he wants to do it, which is a leverage buyout, which means that while he invested some of his own money in the club to the tune of sort of 200, 250 million pounds, supposedly, he also then effectively borrowed from banks to secure the rest of the funding. So I think the original takeover you know, estimates vary a little bit depending on translation from dollars, all that sort of thing. But they, the takeover is worth £790 million, pounds, roughly. Uh, and of that, around 250 to £270 million pounds is the Glazers' money. The rest is borrowed against United before they've even had the chance to buy it, which means that they're immediately plunged into £500 million pounds of debt. Um, so having never had any debt, United are now paying huge interest every single year and have done for the last 18 years uh, to various US investment banks for the most part. Uh, which is predictably pretty unpopular with Man United supporters who protest, who are shouting, die, Glazer, die, and stuff like that on the day he first comes to Old Trafford. Um, and while the the sort of scale of protest against the Glazer family has gone up and down over the years, um, the, the, the general um, attitude has remained the same. Um, you constantly are seeing uh, green and gold scarves as, as a mark of protest from United fans, which aren't the club colours, they're the colours of the sort of founder club, Newton Heath, in the 19th century, but basically a sort of sign that they're trying to say, um, you know, we, we we don't associate ourselves with these American owners. And uh, ever since, they've been pretty much despised. And you get to a point now where uh, the Glazers... So so Malcolm actually has a heart attack pretty soon, or maybe it's a stroke um, pretty soon after taking over the club in 2005. Uh, and he effectively hands over control to his children. So the the, the three sons, uh, or three of the sons, I should say, uh, so Joel, Avram, and Brian uh, are appointed to the board of directors in 2005, and Joel and Avram sort of take on the club's day-to-day running in, I think, 2006. Um, and Kevin, Edward, and Darcy, his other three children, are all added to the board in around the same year. Um, and since then, United started off being very successful. Um, they've done very, very well commercially for the most part. Um, they have the owners have, despite all the uh, sort of criticism from fans, invested a lot of money into the club in terms of uh, buying players, transfer fees. Their wage bill is huge. Um, but gradually, especially after uh, Alex Ferguson retires in 2013, the success on the pitch declines a little bit, um, and you get to the point where over the last sort of five or six seasons, they've not been sort of nailed on for the Champions League, which is the, the sort of premium competition in, in European football. They've sometimes played in the Europa League um, and they've sort of stopped winning titles in the way that they used to be pretty relentless. Um, so you sort of, you, you get to this point where um, all of the stuff that the fans were saying has for a long time been largely ignored because of the fact that even though the club is hemorrhaging money and interest payments, it's kind of fine because the team keeps winning and realistically sports fans don't really mind who owns the team if they're winning. Um, you know, we see that everywhere. That that's why um that's why sports sports watching exists. That's why Saudi Arabia is now, you know, the second favourite country of everyone who who uh, supports Newcastle United. And similarly, you know, why Manchester City fans are quite fond of Abu Dhabi. Um but you get to the point where the success 
falls away and suddenly the Glazers are in the firing line again and fans are protesting much more vociferously. Um, then a big turning point is the attempt to launch a European Super League, the breakaway in 2021, uh, which kind of still now feels like a, a fever dream, I think, for most people who support a big football club. I can't quite believe it happened, but uh, that then fails. And ever since then, the Glazers have sort of uh, made moves towards selling uh, the club. And, and at the end of last year, um, sort of finally went public and said, look, yeah, we're, we're willing to accept offers here. Um, so that is a, a sort of very uh, roundabout and potted history of the Glazers' ownership of Manchester United. And I'm sure some Manchester United fans will um, be all over me in, in the YouTube comments saying that I've got a few details wrong. But I think that is a general idea as to who the Glazer family are and why they are. Uh, are interesting to to sports fans. Yeah, and just from the American side, interesting as um, United get worse in football, Tampa Bay Buccaneers do actually win the Super Bowl um, under the Glazers. In fact, I think they've won two while the Glazers have owned them um, altogether. So it's not as as bad as they may be in the debt thing and how much their fans may hate them. They have actually had success in one of the other hardest um, sports to to get success in. So. It's quite interesting. So they they own an NFL team, they own a Premier League team, and they they're next door. And I I I want to say it's been about three or four years for the first time someone whispered to me that the Glazers were interested in cricket or interested in you know getting getting involved. And it was always an IPL team that they were they were sort of talking about at that point. Um, they did try and get one of the two expansion teams. Um, that did not go well for them. Matt. Uh, no, not really. Um, so, yeah, just during the T20 World Cup, actually, in 2021 in the UAE, um, there was this bidding process for the two uh, new IPL teams, which were sort of provisionally going to be uh, Lucknow and Ahmedabad. Ahmedabad's obviously, um, you know, the team's known as Gujarat, but it's a city within the state. Um, and I think there's something like 11 bidders uh, for those two teams. They all have representatives in this room in this hotel in Dubai. Um, and obviously with the World Cup going on at the same time, there's this whole sort of feeding frenzy around it. Um, and for uh, Avram Glazer, who is the the basically the, uh, the member of the, Yeah, he's the member of the Glazer family. So he's he's one of the co-owners of, of United, um, co-chairs, I should say. And it is, it is also sort of heavily involved in Tampa Bay. Um, but he is the the lone Glazer representative who's who's officially involved in uh, Lancer Capital, who are the holding company that he uses to to sort of invest in in cricket. Um, and it, it's a pretty bad bit of timing for him because United have actually on the same night as the India Pakistan game, which was when uh, Babur and Rizwan uh, chased down 152, I think, um, in Dubai. That was the same at the same time as that's going on. United are losing five nil at home to Liverpool, who are their arch rivals. Um, so it's a pretty bad time for Glazer to then be sort of seen to be not very focused on Manchester United and quite focused on trying to buy a new IPL team. Um, and he has some representatives at, in this hotel room in Dubai um, and they take some financial advice from whoever. They they have a rough estimate as to what they think uh, might be the going rate for an IPL team. It's obviously pretty big money because of the fact that, um, you know, the IPL media rights deal is just around the corner at this time and, and ends up being... I think even bigger than everyone who thought it was already going to be absolutely huge thought. Um, and despite the fact that they are willing to put quite a lot of money in towards buying one of these IPL teams, they end up with the lowest bids for both of the two franchises, which is a, a, a pretty um, a pretty disastrous outcome for uh, someone who is who is pretty well known um, to most sports fans, especially compared to some of the other companies that are bidding. Um, not least because also, I, I think it's worse because. They, they bid less for Lucknow than they did for Ahmedabad, which to me says they must have been no one. I mean, I talked to a lot of people, you know, there were, you'd suddenly get emails from, you know, uh, ownership groups who were interested in everything. No one thought the Lucknow one was going to go <laughs> more than Ahmedabad. So the fact that they, even on that level, uh, they made so many mistakes is really, really interesting to me. So that happens. They don't get the team, bit of a kick in the teeth. I find it very interesting that the next major move in cricket is to go for a UAE team. There seems to be something to do with the UAE government involved here that you kind of allude to in your piece, but I don't really understand it. And we'll get to why I don't understand it later on. But from 
what what are the events that are, make them go from an IPL team to a franchise league that basically doesn't exist yet? So as I understand it, um, having spoken to a couple of people involved on sort of both sides, it all happens extremely quickly. So I think this is literally in the next sort of within two weeks, all the calls are set up. Basically, the Emirates Cricket Board, or it, it, there's this weird thing going on with the ILT20 where it's sanctioned by the Emirates Cricket Board, but it's actually owned privately by the vice chairman of the Emirates Cricket Board. Um, but all of the staff sort of seem to work for it as well. So it's a slightly odd governance structure. And obviously, this is one of these things where sort of people will happily tell you about that much and then won't want to go much further in terms of details. Um, but basically, the, the officials involved in the IRT20 sort of understand and hear and see and all this stuff about um, Lancer Capital, Avram Glazer wanting to get involved in the IPL. They see that he doesn't get one of these teams. And I think their, their first move is to basically say, right, how can we get in touch with this guy? Because um, if you look at the the, the um, owners that have ended up getting the six franchises in the ILT20, um, three of them are IPL teams. So you have um, Dubai Capitals, uh, MI Emirates, I think it is, and Abu Dhabi Knight Riders. Uh, so you can pretty easily work out who the owners are there. Uh, and then the other two are uh, Adani Sportsline and Capri Global, who are both also failed uh, bidders for one of the IPL expansion teams. So it seems like um, someone eventually manages to track down sort of how to get in touch with uh, Avram Glazer. And during a T20 World Cup game, there's various officials from the MS Cricket Board from ILT20 watching this game unfold. And they get a text saying, you know, we've got Av Avram Glazer on Zoom in 15 minutes. Can you come? So they they literally, they set up a call while they're in the stadium. Avram sort of going back and forth with them about what's going on. Um, he notices that they're at a cricket ground and it's like, oh, right, is this where your tournament's going to be played? And they go, yeah, yeah. And he goes, oh, right, can I have a look? So someone then picks up this laptop and basically like spins it round so that they can see properly. And he's like, oh, yeah, great. And then about a week later, by the sounds of things, he suddenly is the owner of uh, a yet to be named franchise in, in the UAE. Uh, mate, just so you know, you're you're banging your desk. Oh, so sorry. Coming through. The <laughs> right. This I was very interested in this part of your article, right? Because to me who's been there, it's a very, you know, these are very beautiful stadiums when you go over there and in his mind, he probably is not an expert in cricket to the level that he needs to be. I mean, they've already done a very bad bid once. He's shown this stadium. It almost feels like he didn't realize that this stadium will probably never be filled for any of these games. Um, and if it all happened so quickly, I really worry about the level of due diligence there. Is that something that you you had a feeling of, early, at least early doors in this franchise? It, it's pretty hard to know exactly because obviously people don't never want to reveal that. Um, but my impression is, yeah, I think it's very much seems to be the case that Glazer hires some people to do this stuff for him. Basically, um, they are then tasked with investing in cricket. And once they fail to bid in the IPL, it kind of feels like it's it, it feels a bit like panic stations. And suddenly they're thinking, right, we need to buy a, a cricket team somewhere because Abby's told us to. How are we going to do that? We've got a contact who says that they can do it in this new league. There seems to be some fairly credible people involved. The stadium looks nice. Brilliant. Let's get it done. Um, and while obviously, you know, there's big money involved in this sort of thing, the whole, uh, the, the Glazer empire is big enough um, and it's never really been an obstacle to them before. So why should it be for this? Um, mm. and, and, you know, while, while I don't think the ILT20, you know, I've seen the first handful of games or whatever, and, and clearly crowds haven't been great. I do get the impression that at least in terms of sort of media rights deals and commercial interest and that sort of thing, there is at least some proper backing behind it it doesn't feel like um some t20 leagues that we've seen in that i don't think i don't think this is going to be the first and last season i would be i would be surprised if it doesn't make it to at least a sort of fourth season bare minimum is the impression i yeah. get at least so i i feel as though yes perhaps there's a slight element of panic you know it do doesn't sound great that within a few weeks of fame but by an ipl team he's suddenly got this new interest in the uae but i also don't think that you know having been put in that situation it's not as bad an investment as it could have been yeah, it, it's really weird, though, just to go back onto the league. So, you know, you quote the Emirates um, person as saying, oh, there's so many Asian people in, in the UAE, so they'll come to the Korea. There aren't so many Asian people in this league. Uh, there's no there's no major Indian players. There's like a couple of Pakistani players who happen to be in this team because it's not owned by IPL or Indian ownership, which is interesting on its own. Um, there's a couple of Sri Lankans. I don't think there's any Bangladeshis. Um, so... Yeah, and so you're sitting there going, well, why are all these people going to come out and watch? You know, are, are they? 
uh, they interested in Sam Billings. Like, is Sam Billings going to be a big crowd? So, and then you've got the other thing of how is this ever going to be a big league if, again, it's got the same problem that every other league does, which is it's not going to have the Indian players. The secondary problem that it has, and, and you and I know this is not the first league they've tried to get up in the Emirates. They've had, a, this is about the fourth <laughs> version. And the Emirates has been the dream league because it's the only league where you can have international players and it doesn't cause any problems, right? Which was a great idea right up until the point that it was going to clash directly with the South African league and half of the best international players are going to be there. If this was a league which had the best international players, I could see it as something that, Hardcore cricket fans in India would still watch, maybe not the casual IPL audience, and then make a lot of money off it. Now, you've got two leagues going on at the same time. Um, so from that perspective, I look at the, the and, you know, I don't want to double, double guess the whole week of diligence that the Glazers seem to do on this, but I do look at it a little bit and think um, it would have made more sense if they got a major league team, uh, a CPL team, or even a South African team, all of which we know those leagues we're, we're going to, I would say, we're probably a little bit stronger in where they were going. And then if you want to buy an IPL team in the future, you're in a very, very good position um, to do that. It, it feels to me like they didn't even maybe take a look if these, I mean, I don't think all the major league owners have even been announced at this point. Like, I don't, there must have been a chance for them to buy a major league team, which I would have thought would have made much more sense. Yeah, so I, I've heard, I can't, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to go too much into the technicalities of it because I think there were some specifics that I'm not going to be 100% on. But from what I've heard, yep. they looked at the idea of buying a major league team and decided that it wasn't for them for whatever reason. I think there was some kind of thing with the uh, ownership structure of sort of when uh, bidders came in, you almost got a bigger share if you were one of the early adopters is is what okay. I understand. I, I don't know the detail on that. Um, and that... You know, that, that's that's my understanding of it, at least. Um, I, I think one of the things that the Emirates League is sort of meant to open up for them or for, for Avi in particular and for the people that are running this franchise is probably the level of access almost to conversations with people who are involved at the IPL because the clear sort of thread when I was researching this story was that um, while they would love to win, ILT twenty in first in the first year, and I uh, you know I don't doubt that they've put together a pretty strong squad. They've got a strong coaching staff, all that sort of thing. The key focus has always been how do we get into the IPL, and I, it feels like this is almost a stopgap thing where they're trying to find a way to get into the IPL. And from you know, my question to you is: the major league is going to have as many IPL owners. Yeah. The CPL already has as many IPL owners, though both of those in the short term anyway are much more likely to develop players for you. Uh, to play in the IPL. The South African League, maybe it's possible those teams were already sold. I'd have to go back and have a look at the details, but I'm not sure they were. I think there was probably a team available there. And I'm pretty sure if the Glazers would have called up Cricket South Africa, they would have maybe found a way to slip them in. Again, a better place to develop talent. I just, I, for me, as a, you know, from a, from a cricket perspective, I am looking at this a little bit like, okay, what what is the end game here? I don't think Maybe the TV audience will be okay. There's never going to be anyone in the grounds. Mm. You're probably not going to open up money to the UAE. Like, I don't think the UAE's the UAE, is, the UAE has such a weird relationship with cricket at this point that I'm not sure even the Glaciers or, you know, any of the rich American um, owners, Elon Musk, I don't think could get anything too sexy out of cricket in the UAE at this point, right? So I, I, I do think it's very interesting that they've gone with that. The other thing is that since they've made that rush decision, right they've actually done a lot of things right as you said they got phil oliver left crickviz uh to go and run a team i'm not sure how good he's going to be at that particular job but certainly he knows the you know he knows the back uh you know all the data stuff and he knows a lot of people in cricket and has very good contacts they've got tom moody as coach so again it's a big name coach i'm sure there are some sunrise of people who again in the comments might be suggesting that the fact that they could pick the pakistani players gives them an advantage over every other team in that league i would have thought but I wouldn't say that at the moment they've picked the, you know, they don't have Shadab and and, um, and um, Shaheen Afridi. That's the two that you would want to make the biggest difference, right? But it does, I, I, from, a, from a cricket uh, perspective, I am sitting there a little bit going, is this the best we can do? Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. I mean, the Pakistani one is is actually worth touching on. So the two guys that they signed, which are Azam Khan and Mohammed Hasnain, I think they they officially announced Azam as a signing and they never 
officially announced Hass name, but obviously there's been various changes with the PCB over the past however long. From my understanding of it, um, Ramiz Raja was very anti the new league for obvious reasons because um, there was a chance that if they shift the window, and by the way, just touching on an earlier point, I'd be I'd be surprised, I'd be stunned actually if the two leagues go up against each other like this next year. Okay. I just don't think yeah. it, it works. Um, and I think that's particularly the case because the South African League, you know, it, unlike the UAE, has fans in the ground and seems to have at least launched pretty successfully in a way that the UAE won, you'd say, a bit more jury out at the moment. But it sounds like, um, yeah, Ramiz was was never keen on them playing, and neither of them is is part of the squad as it as it ends up this season. So neither of them got a, no objection certificate, and there are no Pakistani players involved. Full stop in this league in year one, um, which yeah is a really interesting thing, and I think might change next year in terms of I think Desert Vipers especially will try and um, it will will try to to sign some some Pakistani players. I'd be shocked if they didn't, just given that they aren't owned by an Indian um company in the way that all the other five teams in the league are um but yeah i i I think um well my impression at least having looked through the squads is that there are some pretty average teams in the uh, uae league and i would be relatively surprised if if desert vipers don't end up being pretty competitive in it they won their first game pretty convincingly um and yeah i think in terms of the cricket operation uh i know phil oliver a little bit and I, i think they it, from what it sounds like, he was pretty much one of the first guys they went to, and they originally did it through a sort of recruitment point of view because, um, you know, potentially partly due to involvement in American sports, their first instinct was how can we use uh, data and analysis to help build us a, a, a successful team in a way that you probably wouldn't in English cricket, for example. That would seem like a strange thing for an English owner to do because it's not really the the culture, I yeah. suppose. Um, so they they go to Phil and they try and get him to build the team, and then he gets more and more involved. They realise that he has some good contacts in the cricketing world, and um yeah he leverages them so moody is is doc and then i think they have james foster as is uh head coach then you have uh the support staff has sort of carl crow neil mckenzie asim mood you know pretty pretty stellar it's cast. Good setup. um it sounds pretty good doesn't it and then um i think compared to yeah i think compared to most of the squads i think they've 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 packed it out pretty well and they don't have too many sort of random picks that look sort of, you know, you, you see the the Dubai team, for example, having Yusuf Patan, and you think that's probably not entirely for cricketing reasons at the age of whatever Yusuf Patan is these days, whereas it feels 73. like... 73. <laughs> it feels like um, Desert Vipers, at least, are sort of trying to uh, put together a, a, the squad for so that they can win as many games as possible. Um, and I suppose the other thing to touch on then in, in terms of um, the attractiveness of this league and... and and why, despite all of the the sort of drawbacks, it might succeed is because of the fact that the salaries on offer, at least at the moment, to the top players are huge. So Hales, for example, is earning a, a massive amount of money, um, and him and Billings actually, who are both in the um, both in the Desert Viper squad, they're a really interesting case study because both of them were signed up on pretty low deals to play in the IPL, um, and you actually have this really interesting phenomenon where both of them have pulled out of the IPL for this year, partly because of the fact that. IPL owners and people who wanted to buy IPL teams have effectively come together, started up a, a league in January, which means that, um, which has enough money on offer that Billings and Hales can spend one month in Dubai earning more money than they would have got for two months in India, um, which, you know, it, it's probably not a, a long-term massive issue for IPL. And I don't think IPL is going to make any any sort of massive changes on that. I think that the TV rights deal means that IPL can basically do what it wants and uh, the top players are still going to come, but it is a sort of interesting little dynamic for the sort of, I, I suppose, both of those guys are sort of possible starters slash strong bench players um, for IPL franchises. So it is an interesting dynamic for them that you can almost, especially for the English ones who would otherwise miss county cricket early in the season, Billings in particular is captain of Kent and would have to pay the club back if he misses games and stuff like that for IPL. Instead, he can almost clean up on the sort of B-list circuit of T20 leagues make loads of money in the winter and then still have the chance to play the full summer at home, um, which is quite an interesting yeah. dynamic. No, definitely. I mean, IPL players are underpaid. I mean, based, yeah. <laughs> based on what they should be paid and what the league makes. So it's interesting that these players are getting paid so much. Um, so the boards around the world hate this. This isn't really going to affect the Glazers, but since we're talking about the league in general, <laughs> the boards absolutely hate it. The reason they hate it is because there's no overseas limits on the players. Uh, I think you get two Emirates players in each team, uh, unless they all disappeared midway through the tournament. But that's uh, that was my first ever episode of Red Inker, actually. So <laughs> you have to go back to the start if you want to get that joke. Uh, that's, that's for diehards, Matt. But um, yeah, so the boards hate it because it's not a major league. In fact, it doesn't have list A status. So 
I don't know what's going to happen with the stats of this particular league. It's going to be a pain in the bum for people like me trying to collect them, I'm sure. Um, and we saw that Dave Warner and, and Chris Lynn either used it to get better deals back in Australia or it's quite quite realistic that they actually, um, like Cricket Australia just saw that they were potentially heading into those leagues. Wouldn't surprise me if players like Warner eventually did stuff like that. He's going to make a lot more money in those sorts of leagues. I don't think that... That I don't think that's a huge thing, but I do think it's going to be interesting going ahead because that might, this might be one of the first leagues that is actively, it's an official league, but it's still actively fighting everyone else. Even the IPL didn't really fight anyone else. It just said, well, we're bigger than you. You're going to have to handle it. This one is being able to do that. And as you said, the money on offer is, is really interesting. The other thing is that, you know, we, this is obviously partly about the Glazers, uh, what, why we're talking here. This is not you, – you You referred to the Desert Vipers just like everyone would know what a Desert <laughs> Viper is, right? We thought coming in that when they bought the team, there was a possibility we were going to get the, I don't know, United cricket team. Yeah. You know, and, and that has not happened at all. It's only one Glazier, which is part of the reason. If it was all the Glazers, then that would be a little bit different. Um, and there's copyright issues and everything else. Desert Vipers – it's, I would say about the opposite of a name that you could have from Manchester United in any particular way. Um, is there any links that you have seen at all between uh, United and the Desert Vipers? Well, the most sort of obvious one is is the kit, um, which is a very sort of simple, subtle thing that, or not even very subtle in this case, thing that you can use to give a little nod. So both on both sides, you know, I, I got the official line from Man United for this. Um, piece I did and they said you know we have nothing to do with this franchise just in the same way we have nothing to do with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers there is just a link between owners um ditto on the Desert Viper side they say we have nothing to do with Man United we just happen to have one of the same owners but they do play in Man United colors so they're wearing red shirts with black and gold trim which are Man United's colors and they have a commercial partnership with Umbro who while they don't have a, com a commercial partnership with United anymore do have sort of this um, this link that most football fans will be aware of because they were Man United's kit manufacturer throughout the 90s and I think during the, the treble win in, in 99, which was the key I don't, success. Yeah. I they, also they don't think any cricket teams ever had Umbro before that I can think of. Is yeah. that right? I think that, I think it's their first venture in and, and you think, would that realistically be possible without that link? Um, you know, you can, you can draw your own conclusions there. So I, I think part of the reason that it's nothing to do with Man United is probably the the, um, the Glazers' gradual exit as well from Man United. So, um, you know, as I mentioned right at the start, they're, they're getting towards a point where they're either looking for new investors in the club and they're going to sell a percentage of the club or they're going to sell the whole thing. Um, if the right buyer comes up, there's been, you know, there were various reports during the Football World Cup in Qatar that I think Abraham Glazer was out there and was talking to potential suitors um, to see who, who might be interested and what sort of money they can get. It's all being done by uh, Rain Group, who I think are a big investment bank in the US. So it, it feels like there's a gradual move away from Man United. But I think this is the, and, and to be honest, I think having spoken to, I spoke to a Man United supporters group for this piece, there's a few, um, I think one of the things that really sticks in the crawl for fans generally about, about um, the Glazers' ownership of United is that despite the fact that the fans throughout the whole time have made clear just how much they despise the Glazer family, and they've done that for 18 years, more or less. They they still manage to sort of have a squeaky clean reputation around the world because of their involvement with Man United. It is still something that gives them kudos as a family that um, that no no one else seems to have access to. So when you know, and obviously a, a press release is something very bad to judge this stuff by. But when the press release lands from the from uh, ILT20 originally saying you know we've got the Avram Glazer of Manchester United has joined it. They say, we're going to join forces between football and cricket in a way that's never been seen before. And Man United fans are there thinking, well, this is absolutely nothing to do with us. And they're also thinking if Avram Glazer is investing however many million pounds into a, a cricket franchise in the US, why can't he do some maintenance work at Old Trafford, which is a little bit dilapidated compared to what it was when they bought the club in 2005? And why is the, the, the roof leaking? And uh, all this, all these sort of minor complaints that uh, that kill their match day experience. That, that they then think, you know, how how can this be right? Second best stadium in Old Trafford. <laughs> um, uh, probably not actually. The other one's a bit crap at times too, with the big temporary <laughs> thing. Um, but anyway, uh, that's a, again a, a weird cricket in joke that you have to know that they're both in Old Trafford. But um, 
I don't know if you know this. So the history of um, uh, Manchester United and Manchester City comes about from youth clubs. And it comes about because essentially there's a bunch of knife crime in Manchester at that time. And they had to do something to get the kids to do something. That turns into youth clubs, which turns into football clubs, which turns into this. That It's so weird how far removed Manchester United is from where it started. The Glazers, as you said, might be moving out of it anyway, but there's no doubt, especially within English, there there would have been English cricketers because this was a free agency set up. It wasn't an auction or a draft. You had to go out and buy your players. I think there were players who probably would have signed with um, the Glazers to get tickets to the football and to you know get contacts with footballers and all sorts of things. I, there's no doubt in my mind because I've been involved with T20 franchises and I'll tell you what it's a lot easier to sell St. Lucia than it is Guyana you know these things matter to these players when you get offered the same money from both teams but the interesting thing is that now Avram's involved he's got this franchise you said oh the league will be around in four years and like I didn't even call you up on that but that's a ridiculous <laughs> statement right like if oh, it'll definitely be around in four years time because that's not the that's not the mark of success here the big question is when will the next IPL expansion teams be available? And will the Glaciers have enough money and information about cricket at that stage to be in a position to actually take advantage of it? Because if they don't, they have bought a franchise based on a Zoom call of a nice looking stadium. Yeah, well, it, it's a good question. And I suppose there's a, there's a really interesting answer with the timing of when we're recording this podcast, which is um, the fact that, so I, as far as I can tell, the IPL is locked in as a 10-team thing for the for the next couple of seasons at least. I can't remember. I, I've read some of the details of the rights deal on either Crick Info or somewhere else. Um, and it sounds like it's it, it's locked in as 10 teams for, for the next however many years. The very interesting thing is that the women's IPL franchises are all up for grabs at the moment. They've just announced a very lucrative rights deal. Um, and by the sounds of things, I think there was a report last week on Crick Buzz, it sounds like uh, Avram is pretty interested in maybe having a look at one of those. So I suppose while that is clearly, you know, buying a buying a team in a new women's competition is not quite the same as buying Gujarat Titans and calling them Gujarat Red Devils or Gujarat United or whatever it was going to be, um, that I think that there is a real feeling that, that the women's IPL is going to be pretty huge, um, even in its first season. Uh, the rights deal seems to confirm that. 30 million, was it? The, the TV rights package? I, I, I was shocked. I was expecting somewhere around 20 to 25. Um, the fact that they got that much money from, from you know, two companies who were out, you know, who, who both put in really strong bids. It, it's a huge amount. I think that makes a lot more sense. If I think that makes more sense to me than him going for the Dubai League of where the women's IPL is coming next, we'll just wait and we'll put in a ridiculous bid for one of those teams. Yeah, so I I, I think um, while it, it, it could well be a, a number of years before Avram Glazer owns a team in the men's IPL, I think it wouldn't be at all surprising as far as I'm concerned if pretty soon he is the owner of a women's IPL team. And I think that could be a really easy way for him to sort of, I don't know, expand his influence in India and also get himself to a position where unlike in the sort of, you know, it, it can be quite tough to see other than Obviously, BCCI and uh, Emirates Cricket Board have a bit of a link because of the fact that the IPL has been hosted in uh, the Emirates so often. Um, but, you know, it, it can be harder to see the sort of soft power gains of the UAE League, whereas the soft power gains of being involved in women's IPL for men's IPL is, you know, you don't even need to spell it out. Are we going to see any Desert Viper Ultras? <laughs> well, I did actually, I had a little, just out of interest, really, I watched the first innings of their first game, which they won pretty convincingly. Um, against Sharjah Warriors, who are owned by Capri Global, who, as far as I can tell, are basically a, a massive loans company in India. Um, so more sort of reputable uh, people involved in T20 franchise cricket. Um, but there was actually a huge amount of Desert Vipers kit in the stands and almost so much that it made me, uh, you know, I think <laughs> there's a sort of sweet spot when you have a brand new team and a brand new league and not many people are there, but almost all of them have stash where you think maybe they haven't actually gone out and gone to the sort of potentially non-existent as yet Desert Vipers club shop and bought all this stuff and maybe it's been given to them for free. Um, Just but, fill yeah. Oliver out in the ground, giving, <laughs> out, giving out shirts to everyone. I love it. Uh, thank you very much for coming on the podcast and for being the first Desert Vipers uh, beat reporter. <laughs> thank you very much for having me, Jared. 